Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Research Tuesdays uh, to this evening's topic, Herbal Peril. Um, my name's Inga Davis and I'm the Chief Executive of the External Relations Branch at the University and it's my great pleasure to introduce our speakers this evening. But first I'd like to start by acknowledging the Ghana people, the original custodians of the Adelaide Plains and the lands on which the University of Adelaide's campuses at North Terrace, Roseworthy and Waite are built. Tonight we turn our attention to herbal medicine, an industry that some estimate will be worth 129 US billion dollars by 2023, with 5 billion a year spent by Australians alone. Herbal medicines have been used for tens of thousands of years, and I suspect there won't be many people in the room who haven't tried a herbal or natural remedy, believing in their intrinsic safety value because they're made from natural products. Tonight, we have two leading University of Adelaide health researchers, Professor Roger Bayard and Dr Ian Musgrave, who will present us with the evidence and the risks involved in taking natural products. I'm going to start by introducing Professor Roger Bayard, the George Richard Marks Professor at the Adelaide Medical School. And after Professor Bayard speaks, I will come back and introduce Dr Ian Musgrave. There will be time at the end for questions, so please hold on to them if you can. So Professor Roger Bayard is a Professor of Pathology and a Senior Specialist Forensic Pathologist at Forensic Science South Australia. He has produced over 900 peer-reviewed publications and 111 book chapters, as well as the four-volume encyclopedia of forensic and legal medicine, the Atlas of Forensic Pathology, and he has been editor-in-chief of the Forensic Science Medicine and Pathology Journal since 2008. In 2013, Professor Bayard became an an officer of the Order of Australia for distinguished service to medicine in the field of forensic pathology. He is a distinguished fellow of the Royal College of Pathologists of Australasia and received the John Harbour Phillips Award for outstanding achievement and excellence in the advancement of forensic sciences in Australia in 2018. Please join me in welcoming Professor Roger Bayard. Are we working? Yes, we are. Excellent. Thank you, Inga. That sounded... Don't you love these things? That sounded like uh, an obituary, actually. Um... <laughs> now, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, Dr Musgrave. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Just have to set myself up, actually. My problem is when I talk, I like to actually take you to the screen. I'm going to break my neck doing this tonight. Um, as you heard, we're talking about herbal perils, which is an interesting, that's me, um, interesting title. Um, I would like to say, before I start, I'm not a drug company employee. Um, I'm not funded to do any research by drug companies. I'm not being paid to write by drug companies, and they're not my drug companies. To tell you the truth, if I had a drug company, I'd probably retired 20 years ago and be in the south of France. Um, the reason I'm saying this is because I've been looking at um, herbal medicines for about 10 years now, and every time I publish a paper, I get these sort of suggestions on, on social media. I think the reality is we should be working together, not at each other, because our, our goals are the same, and that's to improve people's health. I'm not trying to sabotage people's health, and I think that's what the message we want to put across tonight. So I'm going to talk about general issues with herbal preparations and then I'll talk about forensic issues because I am a forensic pathologist. So what are the general issues? Well, I was quite naive uh, in this area. I had a, uh, a case, there's no point in me using my laser pointer. Um, I had a case where a young chap um, injected some herbal material and died and so I started to investigate herbal products and I was, I was actually quite surprised about aspects of it um, that people don't pay much attention to, and certainly in forensic pathology we don't pay much attention to. Quality control. To me it seems to be quite variable. But then what do we mean when we're talking about herbal products? 
Are we talking about you know, shiny bottles in pharmacies, or are we talking about the material that you can buy down at Central Market that's just bark and leaves? There's a tremendous range of material that's out there. But really, the questions I was going to ask is, you know, who controls the... Uh, no, there's no way I can do that. Who controls the quality, the composition, and the purity? How do we know that we're getting something that is actually safe? What's the training that's required to sell herbal remedies? Um, are there specific courses? Uh, does everybody have to have it? Um, what's going on? And what about manufacture? Um, my part of this is really just my sort of musings on it. Uh, Dr. Musgrave is going to give you the science, so don't worry, the science will come. But the manufacture is interesting. Globalisation is often a very bad thing, and I think that has hit the herbal medicine market. You're no longer getting herbal remedies from in the same village from the same herbalist. And this is um, a herbalist I met in La Paz in Bolivia in the witchcraft market, Senora de Morales with her two dogs, Chico and Chappy. And uh, they were nice dogs, actually. Um, she sells all sorts of things, you know, um, dried llama fetuses and herbal products. She's been doing that for decades. And clearly she's been successful because the people there know her and trust her. If she'd been selling them stuff that was bad or toxic, they would know. So, you know, I, I think she fits in extremely well into her community. But that's not what we're dealing with in the West. It's now a, a multi-million dollar industry. And every time you have lots of dollars involved, I think that you run into, into problems. If you look at uh, the popularity of herbal medicines, in Europe there's an annual 300 million pounds spent on them. And in the US there's an annual 10% increase in the use. And as Inga said, I think most people here, I have, have taken herbal medicines. But we have identified issues, and that is contamination, substitution, mislabeling, and augmentation. And I'll talk about each of those areas in a minute. Contamination occurs. We've identified some of this. It's also in the literature. Pesticides, including DDT, because the herbs may come from countries where pesticide control is not very rigorous. So it could be that we're actually consuming DDT, even though it's been banned in our country. Heavy metals, arsenic, mercury, and lead, can be in them by mistake or deliberately. Ayurvedic medicine actually thinks that there is an advantage to having some of these uh, heavy metals. And fungal toxins, because the herbs are actually contaminated in the field or they're stored in wet conditions. All of these things uh, have occurred. It's a very interesting study. It's a little dated now, but it looked at uh, 251 Asian herbal preparations in California in the US. They found arsenic in 36, mercury in 35, and lead in 24. And we have found the same sorts of substances in materials that we can buy here. There was a case report in pediatrics of a, uh, a little boy who was five years old, treated with Tibetan herbal vitamins. He consumed 63 grams of lead over four years. And that's a really toxic amount to take. And it can cause permanent brain damage, and he's got a developing brain, so that is something that is really quite, quite a concern. Substitution, in other words, putting one herb instead of another. It can be deliberate. You're putting a cheaper herb instead of an expensive one. And there was an outbreak of renal failure in Belgium a few years ago because of that. It can be a mistake. Sometimes uh, herbalist writing is probably like mine. You can't read it. Um, or there is the same name for different plants in different parts of China. So a name here may mean that plant, a name here may mean another plant. And so you're not getting the same materials in there. It's like, you know, coriander is the name for parsley, mint, and thyme. Well, that's going to affect the recipe a bit. Not the way I cook, you wouldn't tell. Um, in Belgium, the incident, there was a weight loss preparation, and Stefania Tetranda was replaced by a much cheaper Aristocolia fangxi. And so there was an outbreak of progressive interstitial nephritis, kidney disease, with terminal renal failure in people who thought they were taking a safe weight loss preparation. And that's the sort of thing that we have to address. And I think we have to ask, how common is it? Is there something we can do about it? Gentiana's been replaced by podophyllin, and podophyllin poisoning causes damage to the kidneys, the liver, the gut, and you can get permanent neurological damage from it. 
So something that's dear to my heart is the role that traditional medicines play with species extinction. I'm not talking about just animals, but plants as well. And there is a tendency in traditional therapies to believe that if something is really rare and unusual, it adds some extra power to the uh, substance. It's like the Romans putting gold into their medicine. Gold made no difference, but it, they thought it actually gave it enhanced power. 14%, actually 13 to 14% of traditional Chinese medicines contain animal products. So what if you're a vegan or a vegetarian? That's unfortunate. You're actually consuming animal products. We had a, um, a comment from um, the head of one of the complementary uh, medicine industries saying, he said two things actually. One, he said that why would we put contaminants into our preparations? We'd lose complete credibility. I don't know why he's doing it, but they're certainly there. Um, the other thing he said is that we were catastrophizing and that the frog DNA we found in the herbal preparations, it was a frog that had fallen off a leaf. Well, all I can say is a bloody big leaf because we had a snow leopard in it as well. <laughs> um, we found snow leopard DNA in preparations that came from Central Market. So products are being sold in Adelaide that contain snow leopard. And that's a very, very sad thing. It's interesting too because a... Uh, an organisation in uh, England that had been looking at this preparation contacted me and said they had the same preparation from China and when they translated the ingredients, leopard bones were actually mentioned, but not in the product here, so it was being disguised or hidden. The um, Chinese government has passed legislation saying you can't use snow leopard remains if the animal had been killed after 2006, so all the snow leopard there's only 2,000 left going into herbal preparations died before 2006. Yeah, well, I might be a bit cynical, but I think that's unlikely. The Chinese government last year rescinded its ban on using tigers in traditional preparations. I mean, you could eat a snow leopard from its nose to the tip of its tail, and it's not going to make you feel any better. So it, there's, no, there's no evidence that using these animals is of any help at all. Incomplete processing, people are speeding things up. Um, it may leave residual toxins. Aconite poisoning can come from traditional preparations if it's not prepared properly. I've got a paper submitted to my journal last week from Korea about several cases of aconite poisoning because of this. Mislabeling or, or no labeling. Uh, all labeling is not in the language of the purchaser. You don't know what's there. Odd translations. One that we got was it had fragrant bowel. Now, I don't know whether it's to treat fragrant bowel or to cause fragrant bowel. It wasn't quite clear, but uh, fragrant bowel was involved. And obviously, all of this can have an impact on our medical legal forensic cases. The forensic issues with herbal products are that herbal medicines are usually not documented or recorded by the police. So if somebody collapses and they come to coronial autopsy, we'll have a, a list of their pharmaceutical preparations, but we won't have a list of what they were taking that's herbal. And that's because the police, like a number of us, I used to think that natural is not harmful. Well, plague is natural. Cyanide is natural. Death is natural. Um, doesn't necessarily mean it's good. The problem is we have no idea of the usage, and that's what I'm getting at, is we don't know what's going on, and I think ignorance is not a good thing. Are herbal remedies used more or less often in forensic cases? I don't know. What are the types of remedies that are being used? Again, I don't know. Potential side effects? No idea. Potential interactions? Herb, herb, herb pharmaceuticals. We had one woman who died in Adelaide. She'd taken a preparation that contained 12 different herbal products and the interaction caused liver failure and, and subsequently, her, ultimately, her death. We're navigating blind with all of this and I think that's not a good thing. 30% of the US population use herbal remedies. I think it's 50% of the Australian population. A lot of patients don't tell their doctors because they fear ridicule and that's the problem with the medical profession. That's purely down to us. We should not be ridiculing. We should be trying to understand and help. People think it's natural, therefore it's okay. Or they want to actually control their own health and medications. All of this is completely understandable, but I think what we need is dialogue. Even when the herbs are documented, they're often very hard to detect, and our routine toxicology does not cover herbal preparations. It covers pharmaceuticals, but not herbals. 
So why can't we detect these? What's wrong with us? Well, sometimes the substance is below the levels that our machines can detect. They're very powerful substances, so you don't have to have much in your system. And if you don't know what's there, it's just, it's just a needle in a haystack. You're just you're searching for... It's, it's impossible, sadly. Augmentation. This is quite, I think, sinister. Um, it's the addition of drugs that may have been contraindicated in the deceased. For example, when Viagra was discovered, I thought, thank God, how wonderful. Rhinoceros are protected. People are not going to use rhinoceros horn anymore. But what's happening is that herbalists are putting Viagra in rhino horn, which makes the rhino horn look very effective. Um, people who's got a peptic ulcer may be keeping away from aspirin and uh, phenylbutazone, but it may be in a herbal preparation. What's the purpose? Well, anti-inflammatories are certainly going to help an anti-arthritis preparation. If there's a huge amount, it'll probably have a very good effect on your joints. Antihistamines are going to help you with, with allergies. And you think, well, it's, it's natural, it's not some processed drug, so that's a good thing to, to take. Uh, what's the extent of the problem? I don't know. Maybe it's the other way around. You know, maybe it's not a real problem, but I think we need to know. There was a Taiwanese study a little while ago where it's illegal to adulterate uh, herbal preparations with drugs. Nearly a quarter of their preparations had prescription drugs. And the nature and the dosage, unfortunately, is not specified. There's a study in um, Hong Kong more recently with uh, a number of patients coming into ICU uh, with uh, steroids in traditional preparations. I think 61 patients, seven of them were, or 11 of them were very ill, and I think two died. Um, phenylbutazone, if it's undeclared, can cause aplastic anemia. People taking anti-asthma herbals can develop Cushing syndrome because of the steroids. The asthma is better, but they're taking too much of this. They make it hypoglycemia from gliburide. And there was a woman who actually went into a coma. She was taking an anti-epileptic herbal preparation that was full of phenytoin, and so she had phenytoin toxicity. What herbs can do is they can either increase or block the actions of the prescription drugs you're taking. They can have direct tissue and organ toxicity. I think Ian's going to be talking about that. They can interfere with lab investigations. You can have a lab test. The result may not be accurate because it's been um, changed by the herbal preparation you're taking. So it may increase the absorption or block the clearance of a drug you're taking. It may combine with the drug to produce a very idiosyncratic effect. The American Society of Anesthesiologists um, advises people to stop taking herbal preparations two weeks before surgery. It's not that they're opposed to herbal preparations, they're just saying that they can interact. So it's just a warning. They're not saying don't take herbal preparations otherwise, but just be careful around the time of surgery. And the side effects may not be well recognised. You can have an odd effect and you know, people mightn't realise it's a herb. It can be very uh, unique to you as well. St John's wort it induces several cytochrome P450 enzymes. It reduces the effect of warfarin, a blood thinner. So it actually predisposes you to clotting. Decreases the availability of digoxin for your heart, theophylline for your uh, airways disease, amitriptyline for your depression, methadone for your pain. Ginkgo increases bleeding tendency. It interferes with platelet activating factor. And this can predispose to hemorrhage. And even garlic increases the toxicity of paracetamol. So if you're on garlic pills, be careful how much paracetamol you're taking. It also increases the effect of oral hypoglycemic agents. Germanda causes hepatitis. Pennyroyal causes liver failure. Eternal life, which is a bit ironic, causes liver failure. Um, veno occlusive disease by comfrey. Skull cap. I would not take a, anything called... I wouldn't call, take a drug called death. You know, I just... Sort of, pennyroyal, maybe. Um, but, you know, you get nephritis, encephalitis... High blood pressure, high blood pressures, you know, very dangerous. There was another really interesting study that came out of the States that just showed that this aristocolic acid not only can be toxic to the kidneys and cause this nephropathy, but it reacts with the lining of the genitourinary tract, the urothelium, causing mutations, this TP53 mutation, which can cause urothelial cancer, just like smoking can. Smoking irritates the, uh, the lining of the, uh, the urinary tract. Aristocolic acid does the same thing. 
So just some quick forensic examples. If I get somebody who's got a clot in the lungs and they've died from that, and they're on warfarin, what I will assume is that the warfarin dose wasn't enough, they weren't taking enough, or else they just it couldn't counter the tendency to get a, a thrombus. Could that be the effect of St John's wort? Yes, it could. Would we test for it? No, we wouldn't. I talked about bleeding from a gastric ulcer. If I get somebody who's bled to death from a gastric ulcer, would I think about anti-inflammatories or steroids in a herbal arthritis remedy? This person may be doing what they think is absolutely correct. The doctor's told them they've got an ulcer, keep away from steroids and anti-inflammatories. They decide that we'll go to the herbalist, get something that's natural, it's been augmented. Would we test for that? No, we wouldn't. A heart attack, again, you know, if it's got Viagra in it, can cause a heart attack. Would we test? Would we even know? Of course not. And high blood pressure can cause strokes, heart failure. Do we check for herbal preparations in any of these? No, we don't. So this is a, an odd situation at the Children's Hospital. I, I started off as a paediatric pathologist. We had a couple of kids who came in who had complete liver failure. Their livers had rotted, just fallen apart. They died very rapidly. What we looked at, we looked at uh, drugs, we looked at the environment, we looked at pesticides. Uh, did we think of herbs? No, we didn't. I, I, did a, I looked at our file. We had about five or six of these kids going back about 20 or 30 years. Never thought of herbs. It would be very interesting to revisit those cases if we could. And rampant malignancy. I had the unfortunate task this morning of going to the funeral of a, uh, a very good friend who died of gastric cancer. His wife... Uh, likes herbal preparations, I just made sure that she wasn't giving him St John's wort because that can stop the effect of chemother chemotherapeutic agents. And would we think about that? No, no, we never would. Now, there's no doubt prescription drugs are responsible for many, many deaths, and I see a lot of deaths. Suicides, accidents, medication errors. You know, drugs are bad, okay, it's true. But just because we've got a problem in one area doesn't mean we should ignore other areas. Or, or am I missing something? I mean, you know, guns are dangerous. That doesn't make knives safe. I think we should be looking at the characteristics of both in isolation and together. The problems are we just don't have any idea what contribution herbal substances are making to morbidity and mortality in our communities. Um, we certainly have no idea of the extent of their involvement or not in coronial cases. And I'm prepared to go either way. I brought back from Vietnam 10 or so were herbal preparations um, from Hanoi. We tested them for pharmaceuticals, completely negative. What they said was in it, was in it. They hadn't augmented them. We published that. We didn't get any uh, cheers on social media for that, but we were saying, actually, you know, Phyto, I think was the, the company, are pretty good. We get the information and we publicise it. I've run a... Um, uh, it's called preventive pathology. I've done it for decades now. Just taking lessons from the mortuary and taking it back to the community. I've focused particularly on dangerous sleeping environments in kids because we see awful accidents. And what we can do is we get the information, we can take it back to people and say, look, and let's modify the cots. That's what we're trying to do here. What I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to say, look, there may be an issue here. Let's just work together uh, and, and see if we can sort this out. The other thing too, I have difficulty with this. People say, oh, you know, herbs just have a positive effect. If something has a therapeutic effect, it surely must also have the potential for a therapeutic side effect. That just seems logical to me. Ernst summarised some of the problems. Non-medically qualified healers, or non-qualified healers, whether medically or not. Lack of product standards, undeclared ingredients. Non-disclosure of the dose. Doses vary. And also long-term use. What happens if you've been taking this stuff for years? What is the effect of that? We, we don't know. So what I think we need is prospective epidemiological studies on herbal use in the community, in hospital patients, and in those who come to forensic attention. I've been proposing a new sub-discipline of forensic science called forensic herbal toxicology. That would be very interesting. That's Lucy, my dog. She's the only person that actually thinks what I'm saying is interesting. <laughs> she doesn't understand it often, but she's pretty loyal. But I'm not saying we shouldn't take herbals. 
Not at all. That's, you, you, but it has to be an informed decision. And all I'm saying is let's make them as safe as possible and understand them better, understand how they fit in with our Western medical system. And maybe by combining that and doing that, we can actually get a better product. But I think it's really important we just don't put our head in the sand and say it's fine, because it may not be. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bayard. And I think we have a microphone swap happening here. You heard it first, Dr. Musgrave's microphone now. I was, Dr. The, I was the opening act for this, actually. <laughs> Dr. Musgrave is a senior lecturer in pharmacology and chair of the Toxicology Special Interest Group, the Australasian Society of Clinical and Experimental Pharmacologists and Toxicologists. Dr. Musgrave's expertise include Alzheimer's disease, neurodegeneration, neuropharmacology, antioxidants, and the toxicology of natural products. He has over 100 published peer-reviewed papers, with 15 peer-reviewed papers on toxicology of herbal medicines, and 16 peer-reviewed papers on natural products as therapies. Ian writes for the conversation on the topics of toxicology and everyday life and has appeared on the ABC radio talking on toxicology um, topics from gly glyphosate to bun spice uh, essence. Please join me in welcoming Dr Ian Musgrave to speak. Testing, testing, one, two. Can you all hear me? Right. Uh, the bun spice was really interesting. And you may be interested, I'm wearing my frog socks for this talk. Let's see if I can turn this on. Okay. No, okay, it's not going to work. Right. So, Roger's introduced you to the general problem we have. What, what is the issues around adulteration, contamination, uh, and toxicity of herbs in Australia. So our question was, what is the scale of the problem in Australia? But before I start talking about this, let's do a quick straw poll. OK, how many people here think that when you purchase a herbal from uh, a uh, uh, chemist or from the uh, um, health food store that it actually contains ground-up herbs? How many? Good. Would you be surprised to learn that the vast majority of them are extracts? What you're getting is crystalline uh, cellulose with an extract of herbal dripped over it. Now, this in itself is not a bad thing because it means that you get something that's more or less um, uniformly produced. But on the other hand, if you're thinking you're getting an actual ground-up herb and you're not, what else are you not getting or getting in herbal medicines? So... Uh, Again, uh, Rogers talked about what we know about what's happening in Australia. So in 2019 alone, the Therapeutic Goods Administration has issued 22 herbal medicine warnings. Of these, 21 were advisories not to take. Um, the vast majority were not TGA-registered medicines. They were medicines that have sort of come in sideways, back to front. Um, contaminated with a bunch of, of uh, different pharmaceuticals. The most bizarre one was the uh, herbal weight loss medicine that was full of Viagra. Oh. Um, as well, there were five TGA-listed medicines where there were herbal toxicities that were not related to pharmaceuticals that were involved. And one was a warning to be careful that the herbal may stop um, contraceptives from working. So that's a, a fairly random sampling of what's happened this year alone. Uh, periodically, the TGA uh, is supposed to go out and do a subsample of herbal medicines that are registered in Australia and look at their compliance with various regulations. It doesn't seem to have happened in the last few years. So um, with uh, Roger, myself, Forensics SA, uh, Curtin University and um, Murdoch University in Western Australia, we formed a collaboration funded by the NHMRC to investigate this. And so you take a snapshot of herbals that were uh, being uh, taken Australia-wide 
and see what sorts of adulteration and contamination issues were involved. So we went out, and or rather the students who are sitting here in the front row went out, uh, randomly selected and purchased from pharmacies, health st stores, traditional herbal retailers and online, a whole bunch of herbal medicines. Now, when I say online, I'm saying we're getting them from Australian online retailers, from a, a trusted pharmaceutical company.com.au, not dodgy overseas company.com. Um, and we assigned them to categories based on what they were supposed to be doing. For example, psychotropic, which was depression, anxiety, and that sort of thing, analgesic, anti inflammatory, weight loss and cardiovascular, sexual health and immune function. So, all in all, we purchased 314 processed herbal medications, which is a, a fair whack. I'm only going to be talking about a subset of that because we're still working on the sexual health ones. Um, and there was Western medicines, there was traditional Chinese medicines, there was Ayurvedic pre preparations, capsules, tablets, tinctures, herbal teas. Uh, so we had a fair few um, of these uh, to look at. We took subsamples, assigned them ID numbers, and then we analysed them. OK, this can be kind of difficult. Uh, Rod, you show you some beautiful pictures of uh, herbal medicines, nicely ground up into grey, green, and whitey green, uh, in some cases, vibrant orange powders. Um, which plant do they come from? Um, a ground up powder doesn't give you much information. Or as I said before, a lot of the ones that are sold uh, in health stores and so on are extracts stripped onto crystalline microcellulose. There's no helpful information there. How are you going to find out what's in there? Especially if it's a herb which doesn't have a good chemical indicator. Now, things like St John's wort, you can test for hypersin and hyperforin. Well, there's not very many assays for that running about, and you have to use special in-house assays. Ginkaloids, um, special university researchers do that. Typically, your forensic laboratory does not have an assay for ginkaloids or, um, um, or hypersin and hyperforin present. So what we did with our, um, our co colleagues in the Western Australia and the Forensic SA was to apply a unique double-pronged approach, DNA barcoding and metabolomics. DNA barcoding, we're looking at the DNA information in these herbal medicines to work out what sort of organisms are in them. And metabolomics, we are using information from mass spectrometry where we don't actually have to know what we're looking for per se, but where we can assemble from the fragments a picture of what's actually in there. And we also need heavy metal analyses because, as Roger said, there's heavy metals everywhere. So, is this going to work? Oh, look, red dot. OK, so we took our samples, ground them up, extracted their DNA, and then we used uh, primers from um, uh, mitochondria from plants and from animals to pull out plant and animal DNA. Uh, and then we, some assembly was required. Then we used the, the, um, the machines that go beep to um, sequence what was in the as assembled genomes. Um, and then we looked at these assembled genomes against massive databases. Now, which do you think took the most, uh, most amount of time? The uh, assembly of the sequences or the uh, DNA uh, database stuff? DNA database stuff. It took, uh, it took ages to do the DNA database stuff and involved a huge supercomputer. Super uh, whereas the, the um, benchtop DNA analysis can actually do an entire human genome overnight. And here's an example. This is, there's some laryngitis pills. Uh, we've used the DNA barcoding to pull out uh, the plant. There's a sarum. A sarum is also known as uh, uh, wild ginger, and it's full, packed full, generally, of our friend Aristoloc. Ah. Press the wrong button. Aristolochic acid. And so from our uh, metabolomics through the uh, mass spectroscopy, we were able to pull, assemble fragments and said, here, here's the chemical. There's our, our friend Aristolochic acid. And we've got the species there. So we know the plants there. We've got the chemical there. We know this is a danger. And Roger's already told, told you about the cancer potential of this compound and how it caused damage in people who were taking it as a, in a weight loss supplement. So what do we find? Well, roughly what will you expect to find? Um, 
many of the herbal medicines had undeclared materials. Many herbal medicines had undeclared uh, multiple contaminants and adulterants. For example, in the analgesic category, 53% were adulterated and contaminated in some form. In the psychotropic or sleep category, 40% were adulterated and contaminated in some form, and 14% were contaminated with heavy metals. Um, uh, this relates back, these are, we're, see, we're seeing similar to things to what we've seen internationally. In the weight loss and cardiovascular ca category, 56% were adulterated and contaminated. Now, I don't have the um, sexual health uh, data on hand, but we found roughly similar results for heavy metal contamination and for adulteration and contamination. So, what are these adulterants and adult Let's try that again. What are these adulterants and contaminants? Depending on which uh, uh, category we're looking at, between 35 to 65% of these had additional plant DNA. Or plants. Uh, in one case, a decorative, a decorative aquarium plant had been substituted for the intended herbal species. Um, was it deliberate because aquarium plants are cheaper, or was it accidental because they can't tell the difference between the, the aquarium plant and the real plant? Who knows? Between 6 to 31% of medicines, again depending on which category, had animal DNA ranging from rat to bat and frog. Between 5 to 14% of medicines, again depending on the category, had pharmaceutical contaminants ranging from ephedrine, atropine, the immunosuppressant mycophenolic acid, and paracetamol and an antihistamine. Let's zoom in on the analgesic category, and, and there's lots of um, of bars on this bar graph, but I'm going to zoom in on one particular thing, and that's the additional herbal content. Now, this is not um, Aquaman's trident, badly named trident, but is in fact a uh, phylogeny of the plant material we found uh, in what's called a Megan tree. Megan stands for metagenomics, even though the metagenomic analysis was done by someone called Megan. The size of the circles represents how much DNA is there, which gives you an indication of how much uh, of the material was in there. Now, it's supposed to contain celery. Um, and if you can see the, the red circle up the top, that's where celery would lie. We didn't actually find celery per se. We found distant relative, uh, the distant genus. Maybe there is celery in there, but how would you know? Um, but... Cannabinaceo. Who, when seeing Cannabinaceo, immediately thought, Cannabis! Yeah. Well, within the Cannabinaceae, the closest relative to cannabis is hops, the thing we brew our beer with. Uh, and there's a long history of using hops in, um, in, in herbal medicine. So it's probably hops. Which doesn't really matter, because hops is not supposed to be there. It's only had been supposed to have celery seed. So not celery seed plus hops plus a whole bunch of grasses. All the stuff down the bottom in green is grasses. Why are there gra there's grasses in so many of our herbal medicines? Why? I don't know. Is there pollen everywhere? I, I just I don't know. But anyway, so we have a, a, a herbal medicine which is meant to contain celery. We can't really find celery, but we can find hops, uh, presumably, and a bunch of grasses. Now let's have a look at the psychotropic uh, category. Um, when you're taking uh, 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 herbs to uh, re uh, relieve your anxiety or depression, uh, you probably don't want aquarium plants uh, substituted for your, uh, your, fight, your uh, antidepressant uh, or bat DNA in your uh, herbal tea. But I'm going to zoom in on the heavy metals and you can see a number of these things all have heavy metals. The pluses mean, a single plus means you've got more than the TGA allowed limit for heavy metals in your herbal medicine. Two pluses mean it's, it's greater than two but less than five times the amount of heavy metals in your um, herbal medicine. Uh, and you can see that uh, we've got mercury in there, which is double plus ungood. Um, two of the, uh, the, uh, the herbal medicines, the pattern of heavy metals there suggest that the, either the ground they've been grown in or the, the plants themselves have been treated with lead arsenate, which is uh, an old style, um, uh, an old st style um, pesticide. 
not, again, not what you'd expect to find in your anti-anxiety medication. Moving quickly on to weight loss and cardiovascular. Uh, again, we, we see there's animal DNA, there's additional plant DNA, uh, additional pharmaceuticals. Notice in this one we pulled out uh, animal DNA and animal contaminants. So if you've got a bit of rat or cat or dog in your herbal medicine, it's probably due to rats and cats and, and dogs running through the warehouse where they're storing these things. It suggests that their um, storage and uh, processing is less than desirable. But there's also frog, hence the socks. There's also reindeer. There's also shrew. And these are present in levels and patterns that suggest that they're there either they're there deliberately, and frog is uh, used in a number of different uh, herbal medicines, um, or traditional medicines, um, or that some, they, the processing line that they be, they're using was used for a frog-based uh, natural medicine, and then they've stuck, uh, stuck this line on without cleaning it in between. Same goes for reindeer. This is, and this is problematic. Um, it suggests that there's a failure of good manufacturing process in the production of these herbal medicines. Additional pharma, uh, the plants included allergens and toxic species, including the neem tree, which can be partic uh, particularly toxic to uh, kids, and additional pharmaceuticals uh, that included um, the paracetamol and antihistamine. So, th our latest paper just came out a couple of weeks ago. What was the response? As Rogers said, was there a frog on a leaf and it got mixed up with two tonnes of herbal material? No. No. Our, the, if the, the problem with DNA is it's unstable. And if you're finding DNA in this material, it's got to survive the processing so it's not there from one frog on one leaf. But we are cat catastrophizing herbal medicines. It's nice to know we're having an impact. Hippie medicines are often contaminated with animal DNA and more dangerous things. Pharmacy cell contaminated cams, secret ingredients in herbal medicines, and supplements contain traces of frog, but will they make you croak? Now, an important <laughs> thing that Rogers said was we are trying to reach out to these communities who use these medicines. These headlines don't help. They sell newspapers, but the very people who are likely to use herbal medicines, either in conjunction with or instead of, conventional medications, all this will say to them is, we don't take you seriously, you're an object of ridicule. We don't want that. We want communication. So what's the take-home message? Contamination and adulteration of herbal medicines is a problem even in Australia. And we've got significant regulation here in Australia. It may be very easy to get a herbal medicine on the uh, TGA's list, but you're supposed to comply with good manufacturing protocol. And this apparently is not happening. These were problems were found in both uh, drugs that are on the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods, where you have to get a certificate of, of good manufacturing practice before you can sell anything, and non-listed medicines, which shouldn't be sold in the first place. Obviously, non-listed medicines are getting in somehow. Some herbals don't contain the listed ingredients, and we know that this is not just because... It, because that um, our tests are too insensitive when you pick up uh, huge amounts of aquarium plant and not the plant that's supposed to be in there, it's not a problem of our sensitivity. Um, some herbals contain unlisted fillers, which may be problematic. If, you're on, uh, if you've got inflammatory bowel disease or gluten insensitivity and your herbal medicine is full of wheat, which is not listed on the label, it might have the odd problem. Roger's already talked about the forensic implications, but I'm just going to reiterate that you have direct toxicity, heavy metals, viral contamination from animal exposed herbals. There's also potential drug, herb, drug, drug, uh, herb, herb contamination interactions, which could have significant and sad effects. I'm going to end by reiterating what Roger said. We need greater awareness. It's not about herbal medicines are bad. It's about making sure people can make informed choices about what they do. 
Um, in the same week uh, that uh, a, uh, one of the uh, herbal medicines was shown to have toxic levels of, um, of uh, alkaloids in it, uh, the recall for generic ranitidine went out because for some reason it had been contaminated with a potentially cancer-causing substance. But because we have the processes in place to check the purity of, of uh, conventional medications, it was picked up almost immediately. Warnings were sent out, was pulled off the shelves. How many of these uh, herbal medicines are in the same place? We want people to be aware. If you're going to use medicines, you should be used whether they're herbal or conventional. You have to have good information sources so you can use them wisely. And I think I've spoken well enough, uh, long enough, so how about we finish there and then we've got time to um, sit and chat with you all. Thank you, Dr Musgrave. I'll invite you to keep your microphone on uh, for a question and answer and perhaps Professor Bayard, you could come up and take a seat as well. Um, unfortunately, we've only got one roving microphone, so please do be patient. Put your hand up if you've got a question, and I'll pass this one over to you. Hopefully. <laughs> uh, good evening, everyone, and good e thank you, two speakers, for speaking tonight and, and showing us what you have researched. I have uh, two questions, one for Professor... Ah, yes, that one. <laughs> Uh, Professor Byung and, and Ian Musgrave. Mm -hmm. Now, two, quest two questions and two suggestions for the committee as well of Research Tuesdays. So which one should I do first? Questions? Okay. Now, Professor Bayard, um, as the University of Adelaide lecturers tell us, we have to try and get, um, now as, as a, just an observation here, we have to try and get updated studies of things that we claim in our assignments and essays. Now, looking at the studies that were shown to us tonight, for example, the six-year-old and, and a couple of other cases, those studies seem to be dated back to the, to the year 2000 and the year 2002. So I'd just like um, to set some, for you to set, shed some light on that and possibly if those are, if that's the case, whether to show some new research. And Ian Musgrave, um, the 2014 study that you conducted, I'd like to ask you which journal that was in, because I'd like to try and have a look at that too. Um, because I'd like to see the exact names of the herbal medicines, because I, I know this area not as much as you, but you know, I know, for example, Anxiotin and 5-HTP and, and what else we got? Um, Pathoclear and those type of names. I'd like to know the names in that, in that 2014 study. Those are the questions. And the two suggestions for the committee is, um, in an attempt to work together, as Professor Bayard was saying, to heal the people, could, could I suggest to the organisers that we have a debate on this topic? So we may be on the one corner, because we've got doctors and other, and, you know, researchers and, and uh, psychologists here, you know, doctors against naturopaths, for example, a suggestion. And the second suggestion is a lot of us... Get to your question and not deliver a speech, please. Okay. The second suggestion is a lot of us ask... No, no, I've got to... Look, I'm not playing devil's advocate here. I've got to actually stand up for what I believe in. Absolutely. Never write a talk. So... So do others. Um, maybe, maybe I will just... Maybe I'll take my prerogative and answer, right, you, answer your question because there are other people who okay. want to talk. No, last thing, last thing. There are other yeah, people who I, want to I talk. Because I've been to another conference in, in Harndorf about this similar thing. And I, I so you're going to take happening. a third of our so speaking time? Also, the language, the suggestion is the language, some of the language goes over my head. So I'd like to get clarification on that. Thank you. Why does the prospect of a debate say some people, I wonder? It's not the prospect of debate. It's actually practicality in time. We've got 15 minutes. He just took five of them. It's not fair. That's what it is. And in answer to your question, it's a fair cop. It's my laziness. I quoted the, uh, those papers because nothing really much has changed. There's a 2015-2018 uh, uh, paper from Hong Kong papers that show exactly the same thing. So, but yeah, it, it's a fair cop, and I accept that. Um, but I do have updated literature. And you know, just because it's old doesn't mean it's inaccurate. And we, we are still finding this. Ian showed you stuff that we've done in the last year or two. 
So it's happening here in Australia. Um, to save you time, I'll give you the two copies of the paper that I've already got with me. Uh, the third five, five bucks a shot. The, uh, uh, with, with things highlighted. Um, uh, our third paper is, uh, is coming out hopefully in the next couple of weeks or so. Um, and the fourth paper will be submitted towards the end of this year. So this is all ongoing. You're getting cutting edge research here, even though we bought the stuff in 2014. Um, it takes a long time to do these analyses. Um, the, 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 the supercomputer, but uh, and uh, for um, we de-identified the actual um, the actual herbal medicines for the papers, so you don't, won't know if it's going to be uh, insert famous herbal company name here. We are, however, sending off all our information to the Therapeutic Goods Administration for them to follow up. Uh, thank you to both of the speakers. That was. One of the best, if not the best, research Tuesday I've been to, and I've been coming for years. T it's take this man's name, please. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll pay you at it, the end. It's also the most worrying, and especially as my wife takes huge amounts of this stuff. Is there any, from what you say, generally across all the sources, there seems to be contamination and concerns. Are there actually any sources of this stuff that you would recommend or sources you would suggest we avoid? Okay, that's a complex and multi-layered question. Um, the first one is, uh, does, it, does anyone know about the Ost L Ostar system? Okay, right. Um, if you have a medicine of any sort that is allowed to be sold in Australia, look at the, bo look at the box of the bottle. I should have bought my uh, box of the bottle. Hello, sorry. Look at the box of the bottle. I should have bought all my show and tell. And either on the front or the back, you will see something really cryptic like OST L long number or OST R long number. This means that it has been listed or registered uh, in Australia. If it doesn't have OST L and OST R on it, run away. Um, that, that said, uh, uh, we found fewer problems with the Australian registered um, medicines, but they were still there. And <sighs> I can't give any general advice on which ones to, to avoid. Uh, i tell you what, um, based on our, some out, uh, our other research, which has only just been published, um, make sure you read the labels very carefully. For example, if you're taking glucosamine and chondroitin and you have shellfish allergies, don't. Hmm. Um, if you are taking other, con if you're uh, on antidepressives and you want to take some John's wort, don't. Um, so there's some general rules there. Look for, it, it can be quite hard to find some of this information, which is what we're trying to do, is to get this information out there so that we know what sorts of things will interact and what sorts of things are safe to take. Um, and if you're interested in taking medicines with uh, Seralia corifolia in them, don't. Um, yeah, so I get this, it's hard to get a general rule, but there are a number of medications where um, you, 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 there's very little, little we found in the way of problems with in terms of contamination and adulteration. There are others which are more problematic. I'm frankly amazed at your generosity in wanting to discuss this with the proponents and I would hope that someone's been prosecuted for trafficking in endangered animals because there is legislation and these people should be stopped. I, I agree and uh, the, uh, the snow leopard was incredible. I mean, we tried to draw attention to that and got absolutely nowhere. We wrote papers, we wrote editorials. Um, it's horrifying. Um, I just don't know why it hasn't been acted on. I think there's a lot of complexities in that because um, if you identify, if 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 a, if, a, if a medicine has been identified and they're not an, an, an ARTG medicine, there's no one to go to to say you'd be naughty. Um, if there is an ARTG medicine, um, and I can't, was, I can't remember was the snow leopard ARTG or was it one of these under the under the wire ones? It was ARTG. You go to the go to the TGA and then they start a process where they go out and buy something else and check it. And if they're not looking carefully, they, they don't have. To how be how long ago did we identify this? Oh, 
Five years? Five years. Five years. Yeah. And so, and a lot of, lot of snow leopards have gone into herbal preparations in that time. Yeah. Oh, the CITES convention, yes, yes. Yeah. So it's a different piece of legislation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, theoretically, Border Force should have been alerted, um, or, or the customs as it was. Um, and for other herbal medicines, we've been assured by the TGA that Border Force has been alerted, whether or not it's done anything. Because as you see, this, you know, our, our first papers on this uh, was a, a, quite a while ago. Um, and it's, there's still stuff coming in. What's going on? I don't understand. I don't think they read your papers. Uh, yes, that they can't do. Be they, true. They, they write nasty letters to us. <laughs> in, 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 the, in that particular case, they said, why didn't you tell us? Uh, we sent you the data a year ago and then, two years before, and then a year before that asking you for comment and you didn't say anything. Oh. I was Is just wondering... Don't, don't do that. <laughs> I'll have my say. I was just wondering where vitamins and mineral supplements fit into this picture. Pharmacological, herbal? I have no idea because we haven't looked at them. Um, oh, that's, I, that's not entirely true. We did look at some vitamin supplements. That was a complete lie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we didn't look at all, we didn't look at Shows the you how much I'm keeping up. Uh, the, uh, vitamin supplements tend to be regulated as OSTAR. That's registered. And OK, let's, let, let's stop rewind. In Australia, there are two. There's a two-speed legislation around um, uh, medical um, uh, comp medicines you can sell. There's registered these medicines that have uh, a strong evidence they work, and b have the potential to have uh, adverse side effects. Then there's listed, where there's yeah, there may be evidence that it works, uh, but there is good presumptive evidence that they're not particularly harmful. Uh, strangely enough, most vitamins are in the OSTAR category. Uh, because, uh, but, so their regu re regulation and their, um, and their um, analysis and monitoring is much higher. Much, much, much higher. Uh, ha and having said that, um, most vitamins are made by standard pharmaceutical companies. And when they when uh, insert name a famous uh, herbal group here, they've actually bought it off a industrial um, vitamin company. Um, we the few that we looked at actually looked okay. Um, we didn't look at, look at a lot, but we looked at a few. Uh, and I can assure you that the level of zinc in the zinc buster um, cold capsules was actually the right level of zinc. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering if people are taking a lot uh, each morning of different herbal preparations as advised by a naturopath for perhaps a medical condition, would you advise that they have regular blood tests to make sure that, you know, there's no renal failure or no specific damage being created? I think that uh, if you're taking a whole swack of medications, whether it's herbal or pharmaceutical, that regular follow-up is, is really good. Um, I think it's just, uh, it's such a complex issue, you know, every case is different, um, everybody reacts differently, and we're just really at the beginning of understanding this, this stuff. I, I'm thinking more and more of um, gluten um, sensitivity and, you know, people who are getting irritable bowel from it and are taking more and more herbal supplements that are full of wheat. You know, um, you get into that vicious cycle. But I, I think that uh, you know, regular regular monitoring. If you've got a medical condition and you're taking a lot of different stuff, is is advisable. It's also good to find a uh, a medical practitioner who actually uh, is in not the 19th century and can talk to you about herbal stuff. You know, and realise that this is actually part of people's therapy. I think that's a very important point that Rogers raised. He mentioned that something like, uh, in the US, something like 30%, but in Australia it's more like 50 to 60% of people take herbal medicines of some sort. Um, but, uh, but they don't talk to their GP. And GPs don't tend to ask. There's a whole don't ask, don't tell. So the GPs or medical professionals are not aware of what people are using as herbal medicines, and people are 
not uh, are embarrassed to talk about it. And this is we should break this culture down so people will talk and so people can understand what's going on and make sure that our problems are averted before they turn up. But it's also not only here. I, I presented this material in Hong Kong, I presented it in China, and I said, you know, how's this for an example of Western arrogance? Here am I telling you this is a problem. And my colleagues came up to me afterwards and said, so what do we do about it? We'd never really considered this. So isn't that interesting? Just this sort of this, uh, you know, Western line of medicine, which they were trained in, has taught us to be extremely narrow in our approach. And so I've got Chinese colleagues asking me what to do. And I say, I have no idea. We've just got one last question. Could it be that the, um, the contaminants in the medicines are from the excrement of the creatures involved or even excrement of the predators of those animals involved? I think certainly with the, uh, the rat and the cat and the uh, dog, it's quite possible. Uh, I think the snow leopard, though, is, is specifically added because they have leopard bones on the ingredients in, in the, the Chinese preparation. So I think it's a mixture of accidental contamination and deliberate. The frogs, frogs are often used. Um, there's that uh, rare mole that's ground up and put into it for the antiarthritis preparations. That's almost extinct. And that's not, uh, in, there's probably not enough of its excrement around to get in there. Um, Again, what Roger says is very important that for some of the, some of the things like the rats and, and the cats, it's almost certainly due to the rats and cats and dogs playing with the material that's been not stored in properly. For things like reindeer, um, uh, frogs, um, it's, more, um, it's almost certainly that e either the, the lines have been contaminated from a herbal medicine that's supposed to contain these things or uh, they've actually been deliberately added. For the bats, what well, we're not too sure what's happened with the bats. These were all species that are not found in Australia. And what we think was happening is that uh, bats were in the uh, storage areas and urinating on, the, uh, on the, uh, the, what would soon become herbal teas. <laughs> that, that would explain the colour, presumably. <laughs> Wow. Thank you so much, Professor Roger Bayard and Dr Ian Musgrave. A round of applause for their presentation this evening. Absolutely enlightening. Thank you. And thank you to all of you, our audience, for making the time to be with us for Research Tuesday this evening. Our next Research Tuesday will be the last one for the year. The topic is climate changed and it will be a panel discussion with four of our researchers. Please keep an eye on the website for more information to come. Thank you all for coming this evening and have a good one. Thank you.